Yo, what's up guys? I'm here with Q Surrounder, Ryan Messick. How's it going? And uh, I just thought I'd interview him. He's been friends for over a year now, just talking about two plus two. He's also got a two plus two uh, poker goals and challenges thread. It's probably it's like, what, 4,000 posts or something? Yeah, it's a lot. It's pretty now. epic. It's a lot now. Back in the day, he used to do, like, every session, he'd, like, do a whole, you know, hand-by-hand -hand analysis, because you're actually a sports commentator, right? Yeah, I have a sports broadcasting background. I went to school for broadcast journalism, so I was doing, like, probably four or five hands a session, a whole session. Um, Very detailed. Yeah, trip report, a lot yeah. of detail for a while. And then it got to the point where, like, people started to figure out who I was when I was writing different rooms. And I just decided, once I was getting up to, like, 2-5 and starting to play 5-10, the player pool gets smaller, and I just don't need people seeing, like, that many. Yeah, it's pretty common. Most mixed uh, over girls and challenges guys just not want to talk too much strategy after you get to a certain level because people will probably be trying to dissect your game or something like that. And I don't know, that's it's, probably it's, a legitimate concern to a, to a certain extent. It's creepy almost how like some people will recognize you but not say anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like sometimes people will come up to you at the end of a session and say they know who yeah. you are, <laughs> which is like one step above yeah. just like not saying anything yeah, at all. Yeah, that would be. Some people like they actually interview themselves, but some people they like go on the internet and be like, oh, I saw you here, and like just just come and say hi. Don't be a weirdo. I mean, yeah. you know, we're, not, we're just regular guys, so yeah, don't be scared and don't like stalk us and like, oh, I saw you playing it. <laughs> Poor guy last night. It's kind of right. You know what really was uh, the the only one that was like really made me uncomfortable was I went on live at the bike last summer and uh, some kid recognized me and was sitting next to me and like when he realized where he recognized me from he locked in he was like I saw you on live at the bike right yeah 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 last summer right <laughs> and he was just like he did not stop talking to me and he didn't look away from me for a really uncomfortable amount of time I was like can I get a seat change button please <laughs> table change. Uh, that's funny. So you're out here for the series playing a lot of tournaments? Uh, I played five tournaments uh, this summer. I came out the first two weeks of the World Series, last two weeks of the World Series. I played the Millionaire Maker, the 1500 Six Max, Planet Hollywood Main Event, the Main Event of the World Series, and the little one for one drop. Sadly, I cashed all but one, and it was the wrong one, so, you know, I didn't cash the main, but I did do well in the other ones, uh, cool. at least getting into the money. So, Joe, overall good WSOP experience? Uh, I had a winning summer, so I guess in that sense, it, it was good. Uh, and you were out here last summer, too, right? Yeah, last summer I was out here the whole summer, running the house. I liked that way of doing it more. This time I did first two weeks, last two weeks, and stayed at the Rio. Um, probably wouldn't repeat that strategy again. But I did have a winning summer, and I feel like my tournament game's at a really high level now. Um, that said, I'm still probably not going to play that many tournaments, yeah. so, you know, we'll see, but I did have fun, so. Awesome, man, awesome. So, uh, also, you've been getting into coaching fairly recently, maybe less than a year ago. Yeah, um, I don't know when, I think around February might have been when I started that, January, February. It's something that was always sort of part of the plan, um, and in college, doing the broadcasting, I was teaching other students at the student radio station, and I kind of enjoyed that. Um, and it's also kind of cool just, I think it's a way to kind of ground your schedule if you have stuff that's scheduled that you have to do at a certain time as, oh, definitely, pro, definitely. as opposed to just wake up whenever you want, do what you want, when you want, and go play some yeah, poker. Yeah, it's feel good to be on a routine or have like actual obligations like, you know, I have like a few minutes I go to like Toastmasters and stuff like that. It's good to just have something so that you're not just like, I can wake up, go to sleep whenever I want. It's, it might seem like freedom, but you can get really messed up in it. Yeah, it's better easy. be on a routine. Right? It's easy to just like suddenly realize, wait, like I haven't played poker for a week and a half or something. Whereas, yeah. at least it is for me. And so when I've got something kind of grounding the schedule, I like that. And it's also nice when you're running bad, like we all do, um, to have some money that's coming. Yeah, anyway, very so. free. It feels good to like help other people to succeed. Right. And it can also help your your own game just talking through situations. It's interesting uh, because you, you're obviously dealing with players at all different levels. So some are people who play either professionally or like they're already winning, playing part time. They want to go to that next level. Some people that are just basic, like um, you know, they don't they don't know all the basics yet. They're just trying to get to that point. So you kind of get inside their head as you're trying to figure out what you need to teach them to help them. But it also helps you break down other players at that current level and realize how they're thinking about hands and how they're approaching it. I think one of the like most common mistakes that good players make is they just assume like when they're assigning ranges to other players, they assume they think the way they do, yeah. or they assign them the range that they would play on that board. So there's a lot of times that I'll be talking hands with somebody, and they'll be like, oh, like I give him like X, Y, Z, and I'm like, well, you would have X, Y, Z there, but like maybe he's just thinking, I put you on his kick, or whatever, yeah. and then their range is very different. So it's kind of cool to see all the different thought processes. Yeah. All right. So you actually 
actually have like a website too? Yeah, it's um, ryan-messick.com. Uh, my last name's M-E-S-S-I-C-K, and then people can also hit me up on two places. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a link in the description to his, like, uh, his Poker Girls and Challenge Story on his website. Are you still making like videos for that? Or? I will be, yeah. So I like paused everything when I came out here for the World Series. Um, you know, I told all my students, listen, I'll be in Vegas basically the next two months. Well, you, made, you made one where like, yeah, someone sent in a hand history and you kind of like broke it down, right? Uh, I haven't done that yet. I did one of my own hand histories. Yeah. Ideally, what I want is for people to send me hand histories, yeah. especially people that are maybe thinking about getting some coaching and haven't decided yet and yeah. just kind of want to go one hand. Yeah. And so sample. they can get some free help. They yeah. can also see what it's like, get a little sample of it. And other people can also do the same. And that way, too, I get to like, talk about hands, think about hands without giving away too many hands that I play because if I'm picking my own hands, I'm thinking like, all right, like, what info is this giving away to people who know me who I play with, you know, three or four days a yeah, week, yeah. so. Cool. All right, so what are your plans going forward? Like, uh, just going to go back east? Head back to the east coast, get back in the cash game grind. Um, you know, when I came out here, I was like, in between 2-5, five, 5-10, five, like the game looks good played. If not, I'm looking for like the biggest, deepest 2-5 game. So I'll probably be still doing that and trying to kind of build up the cash side. And then, you know, uh, I don't want to say like I full-on got the tournament bug out here. Um, <laughs> but I did definitely see like what my edges in tournaments with really good structures. So I'm going to start looking for those tournaments with good structures that tend to be the like 1,500 to 3K buy in tournaments. So I'm going to try to look for some of those in the East Coast and mix them in the rest of this year and yeah. see how that goes. And uh, you'll be back at here next summer? Absolutely. I, honestly, I think, you know, I think everyone in poker has different goals for the future as far as like, do you want to play full time for the next 40 years or whatever? And I can't say that's necessarily what I want to do. Um, I'd like to eventually get to the point where I have enough money to have other sources of income. And even if I'm playing like professionally, it's not like a 12 months a year, 40 hours a week kind of a deal. But I can't see like ever not being here for the World Series, not being out here to play at least the main event and several yeah. others. So uh, yeah, I, I think you can like pencil me in for Vegas for the next 40 yeah, years. Yeah, Vegas is like, a lot. This is like my fifth year in a row. And yeah, I mean, it just seems like a place to be if you're into poker. I mean, it's the biggest, all the tournaments you could want, all the different, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of variations of the game that if you play like stud or anything, well, this is the place to come because yeah. they have all you the can't get it elsewhere. And yeah. I, I want to learn those games. It's a shame that we don't have online poker the way we did you know, 10 years ago. Jeez, it's probably longer than that now that we were probably 11 years because uh, 2006 and 2000. Were the bad years for us, like it started to go downhill. I wasn't even playing. I was, I was okay. even playing at okay. that time. I got See, into. I was like, playing online back in the day. I started so, playing home games in 2008. So okay. So back then, <laughs> like if you wanted to learn stud or whatever, you yeah, go on yeah. Poker Stars or like way back yeah, then you like go on Party peak, Poker. Peak of the, the boom. Right. You could play you know, like 25 cent, 50 cent. I heard everyone. Learn. Everyone was like, you know, that most there's a lot more amateurs compared to pros. Now it's like. Yeah, I think the balance is a lot different. Yeah, uh, the games were amazing. I mean, here's the thing: you couldn't turn on the TV and watch sports without seeing either a money maker. Yeah, I remember money maker. I've seen that in the end all the time. Party poker, like with a little sing songy thing at the end. But like yeah, back then, so if you want to learn a new doesn't... game, you go on there and you take your lumps playing. You play one cent, two cent. If you want, right? Yeah, like, you can dust off two binds learning the game rather than like playing live where there's a certain minimum stake. You, you can know, dust micro off a few binds for less than the iced tea they just offered me for seven dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so like, you can learn a game for next to nothing. Yeah. Uh, whereas nowadays, like you know, I don't really have access to an online poker pool where I live. So uh, if I want to learn those games, like you're either talking, I play so low that I can't even beat the rig. Or I play like 20 40. There's not really much in between. Yeah. So, like, to kind of learn the game and take your losses early can be pretty expensive. But I definitely want to learn mixed games because, you know, one of my goals for sure is, is to win a bracelet. And if you want to win a bracelet, you and you're practice. only playing no limit holder, yeah. it's really, really hard. Yeah. You got to beat 4,000 people, you know? Yeah, actually, I think like no limit holder is the most material there. So, I think a lot of people have a pretty good baseline. But those mixed games, a lot of people, they just, they're not very experienced. Just for the same reason you mentioned. Yeah, so if you can get some level of confidence through that, uh, yeah, your, your chances of winning a bracelet are a lot higher. And the fields are a lot smaller in those games. You have people that are also making mistakes in those in those games that are like ridiculous mistakes. They're just not making them on the whole yeah. Even the recreational players, where like you know people are calling bets when like just looking at the up cards in some of these games, they can't beat what they see, <laughs> and they're paying off. So like, and, and I have people telling me this, and I've talked to some of the people, and like, how long do you think it would take 
to be able to like play a 1500 like horse profitably. They're like study for a few months. Like you also have the guys who are chasing bracelets. I won't name names, but these guys who are just gonna fire at every yeah, single. Yeah, they event. got the money that they. Right. It's just worth it because they got the side bets, bracelet and, bets, right, whatever. And they can be world class at many events. And like, so like Jason Mercier is a great example of somebody who's actually very good at all these events. And he gave Vanessa himself a huge scare this summer. I mean, she actually had a hedge and lost money anyway. Yeah. But. You know, you have people that are just like, well, the 10K Raz or the 10K Stud's gonna have like 150 or fewer people. Yeah, like, you got a million dollars on the line, you might as well take a shot. Like, or, or, or if like you think it's worth it for your marketing, like maybe you have two bracelets and you feel like if you get that third, you're gonna start to get sponsorships or whatever. Yeah. So definitely. you have people that are like throwing 10K or throwing 1500 into these events that don't even really know how to play them. Whereas I want to be one of the guys that knows how to play them and can, and can try to win bracelets that way. Yeah, so. if, you're, if you're gonna make a career out of it, you should definitely win all the games. I myself, the only game I really know is like no one holds on PLO. That's, I was actually playing a like Limit, uh PLO eight. Okay, I, pretty fun. very little. Um, it's kind of fun because you got you know you're trying to go for the low and the high. It's a lot more going on than just no limit holds. You right. Four cards. And you get people making really good games. mistakes in those too because they'll play for only half the pot. So I played like yeah, some yeah. five card PLO, but not PLO eight. Um, it just doesn't really run in my casino, but. Definitely, it's like, I want to learn all the games, and it's good, like, you know, people say, all right, you know, you're comparing poker as a career to something else. Well, you have job security, because no one can just take your job away. But what can happen, a lot of things can happen. You can have, like, the management of a poker room change the way they're running it, and it can hurt you in a lot of ways, and maybe even fill off the games. Uh, and you can just have the games get so tough to where your hourly gets slashed. And like, you know, people don't think about inflation. If you want to outpace inflation, you have to keep moving up in stakes. You're just not going to yeah. get a raise in the stake you're playing. It's actually the other way around. So being able to play all the games is a good form of job security to where if you walk in and like the action player is sitting in a PLO game, you can jump in that. If you're sitting in a stud game, you can jump in that or whatever. If No Limit Hold'em dries up. You know, if we've been through this huge boom in No Limit Hold'em, there's so much information available. And I, I have to wonder how much that's going to happen in any other game in the future because the other games can be more complex. Complex. And I think to some extent there might be a resistance to do it because people have seen the effect on the normal holding games by all the information that's out there. Yeah. Yeah, and who knows, like, you know, used to be limit holding was like the main game, and then it went to no limit holding, so who knows what the next game that could be that could gain popularity. So you want to have experience like learning a new game just so you can be ahead of the curve. That's when like like you said back in 2006 or whatever, that's when the games were buttered off because no one knew how to play. So if you if you be ahead of that curve. Uh, you could potentially make a lot of more money. The best way to like <laughs> sum it up for you, because you weren't playing back then, is the way you feel now when you flop a set is the way you felt in 2004 like top if Top Fair is Top Kicker. <laughs> like if you have Ace King and the King hits, you're just like, I'm going to get stacked. <laughs> right, like, yeah, and if you run into a set, it was like ridiculous. Like, yeah, everyone thinks like they flop bottom pair, like, oh, that's pretty good. It's hard to make a pair, right? Not even that, it's just like they're just out kicked. Like, yeah. They're playing like right, any yeah, Ace, any King. Any Top Fair. Yeah, and it was, oh, it was amazing. <laughs> like, one of my biggest regrets in poker was back then I was in college and I was playing it for like a sorts of income, but it was for like beer money and you know, spend money on the weekends. I was taking the game seriously, but I wasn't taking going in bankroll seriously. And I never tried to move up in stakes online, really, above like 100 no limit. Uh, maybe a little 200 no limit, but that was really it. Um, and so I always would wonder, like, the games were so soft. If I had tried to move up in stakes then, where would I have been? But I just had no, like, we live in America, I didn't dare want to take it away. Um, but, you know, that guy down the street, his buddies, uh, speaking of Shelton Adelson, the Venetian, you know, the lobbyists wanted to take it away because they were worried about the brick and mortar casinos. Yeah. So hopefully we eventually can get it back because that's the way yeah. we could get another boom. I heard, I heard California is supposed to, they potentially could be getting in the next couple of years and that's, you know what, 30 million people. That's California would be huge, New York and PA are close. If you could get a block of states like New York, PA, you already have New Jersey and merge them together, to me the biggest thing is advertising markets. So like right now you have it in New Jersey but there's no big media market in New Jersey. So if poker stretch wants to advertise, they have to spend Philadelphia or New York money, which is huge money in advertising and most of the people that are reaching can't play. California would be big because all their media markets are contained. Merging a few states in the East Coast would be big. Yeah. And like I think if what we need is when you turn on like, you know, football on ESPN on a Sunday night or whatever, 
that, or a Monday night, the Sunday night would be on NBC, you would see like, you know, a poker stars commercial with Daniel Negreanu or whatever. Like, I would rather, like the full tone commercials were great. The way they ran the company, obviously, horrible. Yeah, but you know, like yeah, possibly good marketing, a good marketing. the DOJ. Yeah, yeah. But they made some really funny commercials. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But stuff like that for stars and for whatever other sites would become available, WSOP has a brand in that. Uh, you know, that's what we need, because we need definitely, like, definitely. you know, the average and guy sitting at home to get on, a call. Online's, on. online's tied to live poker. Like, if online comes back, live poker will become more popular too, I think. Yeah, I mean, keep a satellite in for big events. It makes all of them softer. It gets people coming into the casino. Yeah. Like, I've always said, listen, like, there's a certain barrier of entry to walking into a casino to play poker for the first time. People can be a little nervous. The buy-in is higher than it would be If online. you swipe a credit card, Fire it up on a computer. Right. No one's gonna laugh at you if you if you dunk off a bunch of money. No one really knows. And at you know? that point, you've learned how to play. Yeah. So then, or at least the basics. So you're not gonna like walk in and not know what the big one is. So uh, yeah, I think it's huge, and hopefully we get it. Um, and it's one of those things like poker players we tend to be lazy, and I can do a better job of this. But we've all got to just you know, like write you know letters, emails to our congressmen, and really push for it because people on the other side are working very hard to keep us from getting it. So uh, hopefully we can get it. It would be. So you moved to Maryland, right? You from Delaware originally. Originally from Delaware. I moved to Maryland in November. Um, yeah, Delaware. What do you think of the new casinos there. like Maryland Live, Baltimore? Uh, They're not studio. nearly as good as they were when they first opened. This happens everywhere. First opens, everything's great. Um, and then it just slowly deteriorates. And I, like Honestly, the Maryland game is, to me, um, my lease is up and in the fall, and I'll think about where I want to be. Um, you could always but, try Florida. The I promised mean, land. I like, yeah, <laughs> everyone talks about Florida, um, you know, people talk about different places. I think one of the big things, too, is, like, when you do find a new place, everyone was going online, like, all oh, the Maryland games are amazing. So then, like, I mean, you just go on 2 plus 2, and it's like, all these people are moving to Maryland for it. Um, and, you know, maybe, like, I wouldn't have even ended up there. And so, like, now you've got me and your player pool, <laughs> and, like, a bunch of other people like me who have moved. Uh, like, one of my friends there is moved from a few states away to play poker there, so. Uh, you know, you gotta protect your games when you find them to some extent. Yeah. Um, but any new place that opens, and, and that's a good thing too. Like we're gonna have a lot of new places opening on the East Coast in the next five years or so. Um, yeah, I heard Boston's supposed to be a good. Win, one. Yeah, Wynn will be opening one there, and you know we know they know how to run a tremendous poker room. So. Uh, that so could so be even though good. the online climate is not great in America, live poker is still expanding. Still, uh, I know the numbers at WSP are like. Roughly the same, but uh, there's still new casinos opening, so I think poker at least will maintain popularity for the I would say so. future. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, new casinos are opening, and every time a new casino opens, you know, for the most part, they're going to have a poker room, especially if they're run by MGM or Win, who place more value on that. Like, you look at all the best rooms, uh, or Sam's, uh, but we don't really like them because they don't have a poker thing. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you look at the, all the best poker rooms in Vegas, most of them fall under the MGM or the Win brand. So. Yeah. So, like, for new players or inexperienced players, what do you think are the top three tips for someone who like, wants to improve their game? We're talking about, like, relatively new, not winning players. Yeah, someone who's, who's like, you know, plays for fun, but they maybe want to take it seriously, like, either, you know, just become a winning player. Or what do you think are the okay. top three? Uh, step one, track your results. Uh, if you're going to become a winning player, you've got to know how much you're winning or losing and, and track them over the long run and understand, like, what the long run really is. It's a lot of hours. Uh, so that's definitely one of them. Uh, number two, typically, for a new player, is going to be to tighten up. They're probably playing too many hands and until they learn how to play at a high level. Tightening up is going to help them a lot, just play fewer hands. Um, and number three, I think, is, uh, and, and this could almost be number one, but I kind of put it in chronological order, but this might be the most important, is just think about like why you're doing what you're doing and different ways you can play hands. I think one of the ways I got good was uh, you know, driving home every time when I was learning how to play. I mean, all right, how could I play this differently? How could I play that differently? What did he have? Well, what if he had something else? Like, how yeah. could this have worked? Range versus range, or click through all of 